Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, but not more. Today we are continuing our discussion of Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt. I'm finding that I'm continuing to have some difficulty in approaching this text in my usual style because the experiences are so raw and so tragic that it feels inappropriate to be like, oh, here's like some poetic thing that I'm saying it or some literary quality that I'm saying it. In one sense, like the story is too honest to, for the me to approach it from like a literary analysis um, and for that to even be relevant in one level, but it is beautifully written and it is, it's not, it's difficult to read in that um, the story is very sad and is very tragic and it's hard to read about people suffering um, as much as they are, but it's not difficult to read in terms of reading level or vocabulary or complexity of sentence structure. A lot of the sentence structure really represents his, the childlike perspective that he's representing through this narrative from you know, his earliest years. But I will still try to talk about the concepts that I see because the concepts of literature are relevant to the concepts of life. My notes are definitely sparser than what I have for the same number of pages that I would read in a fictional novel. So I don't know how much I have to say today. It might be a briefer video, but either way, let's dive into it. Also, I'm having like skin issues and now that you get daily updates from me, you get to see the ups and downs of my skin, which has problems. Anybody out there with cystic acne in my comic section, give me a shout out because I have like a huge, you can't tell because I've covered it up with makeup, but um, the shape of my nose is different today because I actually have like this really swollen zit and my nose hurts really bad. Okay, so um, one thing that we see with this endless addiction to alcohol and the father and the family being so dependent on him is the way in which hope can be a torture. So the father has been in Limerick now for a little while, but because he has a North Ireland accent, he's having trouble getting work. And he finally gets a job and you can see his wife, Angela, start to have hope and make plans. Oh, we're gonna move out of this, you know, sort of slummy apartment and move into somebody somewhere better. Oh, we're gonna buy these pieces of furniture. Oh, we're gonna have shoes for the kids on a more regular basis. You know, we'll be able to buy these clothes for the kids and things like that. And of course, those hopes are dashed very quickly because of his addiction to alcohol. And in that you see, you know, the human spirit really does need hope to have something to live for. Obviously for anybody out there who's experienced depression, it really is that feeling of a loss of hope, a, a, a mute, it's like putting a mute button on your emotions. So hope is a very powerful, positive emotion, but when you have hope followed by disappointment so frequently in your life, hope almost becomes a torture. We see this repeated death imagery throughout from even the previous section of reading that we had where one of the opening scenes was Frank McCourt is on a seesaw with his brother. This is in a park in New York, so this is like way earlier on in the text. And he, you know, kind of unthinkingly just like hops off the seesaw and of course his brother whoop, falls down and he happened to bite his tongue, which causes his mouth to fill with blood. This imagery gets picked up later. So that same day, Frank sees a dead dog in the street and connects the blood. And then that later he has the sort of dream of the myth that his dad t tells him. And I'm not, really not good at Irish or Gaelic or... I took Gaelic briefly because Lord of the Rings was really big when I was in high school. So Cuchulain, I think is the name. Cuchulain, I would guess is the pronu pronunciation, but I have no idea. And so there's a myth story of there's a bird that sits on Cuckoo Lane's shoulder who, when Cuckoo Lane passes away, finally dies, he's this larger than life warrior who defeats many English and defends the Irish. He drinks the blood from Cuckoo Lane's body. And so you again have that imagery of the blood in the mouth and this death imagery that comes through. 
and that happens, you know, on multiple instances throughout this memoir, is, and because so many people are dying in his life, no doubt that there's a lot of death imagery. We see also that the basis of Angela's poverty is actually that the English took the family farm and distributed the land to other Brits. And again, I talked about it yesterday, but the degree to which sort of these cultural in-groups and out-groups and language and accent, and they even talk about like <laughs> when you're on the outs with someone and they're not talking to you. So this form of communication and non-communication of blocking of, of in-group and out-group, whether that be through accent or language or whatever, their cultural identity is very, very strict and strongly enforced, whether you're a part of the you know, this like brotherhood that's highly participatory in the Catholic Church, then you're in or you're out. Whether, you know, in your catechism class, you're learning, you know, your catechism in English, in Irish, and also in Latin. And so it's like, you're really sort of, the way in which language is used as a barrier or an entryway is very, very important. And all of that is coming down to this cultural identity, which of course is tied in with the way, the patterns of behavior that we see with Frank McCourt's father. When he gets drunk, he wants to talk about the time that he served Ireland in the, in the war as a part of the rebellious army, rebel forces, and he wants to sing these patriotic songs, you know, and um, sort of like relive those days. And so this sense of like cultural identity being kind of ripped from the Irish as at core to his father's grief and his father's sort of undealt with demons throughout. Another thing that really struck me in this novel is the way in which, you know, I feel like I've always had a sense that like, oh yeah, old school educators, we knew that teachers would, you know, be able to use the rod in the classroom and would, you know, beat children and that sort of thing and have like corporal punishment and physical discipline for ill-behaving children. But the way in which that happened in the story and the way in which I guess adult authority is both cruel and nonsensical. Um, it's that combination of cruelty and nonsensicalness that makes it just like that much more of a torture to watch. If the teacher were strict but rational, it's sort of like, well, then I know the rules at least to play the game by, so that if I don't want to get, you know, beat with a ruler or a beat with the rod that, or with a switch or whatever the case may be, then at least I know the rules of the game. And this again speaks to that quality of abuse throughout emotional, physical, drug abuse or alcohol abuse, like just throughout the story and under that sort of being the source of all of this tragedy that we see happening to all of the lives of the people, right? So that was... Uh, it's not fun to read, but very interesting in the way in which corporal punishment is used. And then finally, I wanted to talk about Frank McCourt sitting on the seventh step and talking to the angel on the seventh step. So his family, his parents continue to have children as, you know, birth control was not a thing at this time. So it's bound to happen, right? And so even though they have these tragic deaths for their children, she keeps getting pregnant, she keeps having more kids, even though they're poor and they can't really afford it, you know, and it's sort of like, is it a moment of joy or is it a moment of suffering? It's such an intermixture, you know? And so they tell Frank a little story that, you know, the angel on the seventh step of the stairs is the one who comes and delivers the baby. It's basically their version of the stork story, right? And so this idea sort of gets into Frank's head and he will frequently sit on the seventh step of his staircase and to talk to the angel. And again, it just is so heartbreaking. It speaks to this, that he doesn't have anyone to talk to, not his parents, not his brother, not any of his extended family that's in Limerick. The only other person that he can talk to is there's a gentleman that he ends up reading the newspaper to, or no, um, Jonathan Swift too. I forgot the character's name for that gentleman's name. Um, Mr. Timoney. I happened to open right to it. And so that becomes a, an adult figure of someone that he can speak openly with. And again, this like, this bridling 
of the of the mouth of the tongue of what you can say of what you can't say of how to be polite of how to get on in the sort of like social culture i like i'm i'm not quite sure what it means or or how to articulate but there's something going on here in this novel with language um and, and maybe it really comes down to that's part of the process of memoir is taking back your story from from your abusers taking you back your story you know uh, of suffering and brightness and, and goodness and badness all together, that it doesn't just belong to your parents, that it doesn't just belong to the people around you, but that you have the right to your own voice and you have all these authority figures in your life telling you not to ask questions, not to speak up, not to, why do you have that look on your face? You know, you're always kind of like buffeted and controlled and tapped down, um, especially when you have chaos and, and alcoholism sort of affecting the whole family unit. So anyway, that is a smattering of my thoughts from the last section that I read. I'm about halfway through the book. I'll probably read another quarter today and talk with you guys on Wednesday, tomorrow, about it. Uh, I think I'm going to finish it up on Thursday. So I'm really excited because you guys have been voting on my poll. So we shall see what pulls out ahead by the time that the poll closes. It's still open on Twitter and it will be up every Monday. So go check it out and we'll see what we'll be reading for Friday. My name is Alexandra and until next time, I'm still a bibliophile.